Um, so it's Thursday evening, it's seven o'clock. Uh, welcome back, I should say, to the um, first of our new series of um, RDA 30 minute webinars after our summit break. Thank you very much for, um, for coming along this evening. So um, to kick us off this evening, um, to uh, coincide with International Sight Loss Day, we are very delighted to be welcoming Zoe Foster, who is Service Marketing Officer for Guide Dogs. Um, and she's joined this evening. We're very delighted by Mary Leith. And I should say hello also to Chelsea. Um, so Mary Leaf is um, chair of Altrincham and Hale branch of Guide Dogs, um, and you'll also see uh, Chelsea there giving us a wave. Um, who is her assistance dog? Who's been with her, I think, for about five years. So um, both of those are far more interesting than me. So I'm going to firstly hand over to um, Zoe, who is going to tell us a little bit more about the services that people can access. Um, and an overview of um, some of the children and adult services. And then, um, and then I think we'll hear from Mary. So um, welcome to you, Zoe. Oh, thank you for having me tonight, especially on World Sight Day. Um, I'll just give you a whistle stop tour of all the different services we have, and then also share some links with Caroline afterwards. So if you'd like to find out a bit more, you can do that at your leisure. And then pass to Mary, who's going to tell you a little bit about her experiences of having a working guide dog, but also her love of riding too. Um, so first of all, guide dogs has come a long way. Just last week, we celebrated our 90th birthday, and that's 90 years since we qualified our first partnerships on the Wirral in Wallasey. Um, and from there, initially we started with just a dog service. However, now we're the largest provider of services to children and young people with vision impairment as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about our children's services first and then a little bit about our adult services. Um, so first of all, we have our early diagnosis and family support services. And that can really help when families have concerns about a child's sight. It might be that they need a little bit of support understanding a diagnosis. Um, sometimes it can be explaining hospital visits and all the tests that a child might have to go through and not really knowing what those kind of things mean or maybe some of the terminology is sometimes it can sound quite complicated. Um, it might also be going through things like benefits, maybe signposting to local support in their area that they can access, maybe, maybe a family group, maybe a local authority. Um, and also um, emotional support and practical support. Um, it might be quite a traumatic time, sort of understanding uh, sight loss um, and actually navigating what's out there, particularly if you've never had any experience of it. And we're able to give practical support with that and also give you ideas of how to interact with your child and also access to our other services that may also be of help. We also run family events and there's a peer support group that people can also access. Um, we also have an education support team and they help children between the ages of 0 to 25. And that's led by QTVIs, which are qualified teachers of visually impaired. So they've got lots of specialist uh, experience they can give. Um, and their role is to give impartial advice um, and information to families. It can help them um, understand what their rights are and what their entitlements are. It can help them maybe when selecting a nursery, for instance, or a school, um, understanding what support should be provided for that child um, in those environments as well. And also identifying um, if there's any gaps that's been sort of missed. Um, they're also able to act as a mediator and that just helps parents have good relationships with those establishments and allows us to ask maybe perhaps the more tricky questions on their behalf and help them navigate through that. And again, just giving that support when at times people feel that they don't actually know what, what they should be entitled to, what they should be getting. So they're able, able to do that. Um, Last year, we brought out our My Time to Play sessions. Um, so they started virtually um, as a result of the pandemic. And they're geared towards uh, children who are aged 0 to 4. 
And what they do is they support parents and children to develop practical skills through play. Uh, and they're based around maybe a sensory story um, and related activities. So it could be craft activities, it could be yoga, it could be songs, and all using things that you might have around the house um, and that you can access, access very easily. Um, and these activities are all with a view to achieving uh, developmental goals uh, for that those individual children that are attending. Um, it also allows people to meet other families in the same situation and get a little bit of peer support. Um, now, as I said, the sessions have been virtual up to September of this year, and now we're starting to introduce them across the country as face-to-face -face sessions. Um, so you have a total of seven sessions over 14 weeks, so that every other week, and it allows families to uh, put into practice the things they're learning along the way uh, on that week where they don't have a session. Um, and they cover the five areas of development. Um, so that's uh, concept. So it could be the concept of time, when you play, when you eat, when you sleep. Um, it could be sensory skills. So touching things, uh, learning about sound, maybe about textures uh, and encouraging children to, to explore uh, and the environment around them. Um, it might be fine gross motor skills, uh, developing a range of movement, which could be rolling, it could be crawling. Um, things like self-help, so maybe feeding and dressing uh, could be incorporated into that. And, and communication, which is the key thing because 80% um, of learning is visual. Um, so what we need to do is encourage good communication to allow children to understand the world around them, but also support parents in, in doing that and giving them the, those, those skills that they need to be able to do that well uh, and help that child develop. Uh, we also provide mobility training um, and, and life skills. And we do that through our local authority contracts in some areas, or sometimes uh, families buy that in through a child's budget. Um, and that's looking at things like mobility in terms of learning routes, maybe using a long cane. It could be um, life skills such as maybe going to the shops, paying for items. It could be cooking and baking and learning all those skills that are associated with that. So it can cover a wealth of different things uh, for that individual child. Um, we have another service which is Custom I Books, um, and that's where we have over 4,000 book titles um, that families can access, and it's free to join up. And you can request books in your particular font style, whether it's a particular colour of paper that you would like, um, particular binding, uh, maybe a spiral bound book, for instance, um, and also spacing, it could be in braille. And all those books are produced at the cost of a regular book that you will get in a, get in a bookstore. And they also include uh, fiction, non-fiction, but also textbooks and educational books are also on that list uh, for families to access. Um, they're also available to children with dyslexia, so it's not just visual impairment, that service. Uh, children with dyslexia can also access them too. Um, we also have our buddy dog scheme, uh, which is for children aged 5 to 18 years. And that's um, a dog service uh, where a trained, friendly, what we call a pet dog is put in place. Um, and it's to encourage well-being and confidence um, within a child and that dog. So they build a relationship. The child might help feed the dog, look after the dog, play with the dog all with a view to sort of increasing emotional well-being um, and allow them just to develop a trust and a bond and have fun with that dog. Um, they're looked after and paid for by the family, uh, but Guide Dogs remains ownership of that dog, just to ensure that it, it's being looked after in the way it should be. Um, these dogs don't have any access rights like a guide dog. Um, so they would only get goodwill as a pet dog would when out and about. Um, we run discovery sessions on a regular basis across the country uh, in the form of webinars that people can access and those tell you all about um, the, the role of a buddy dog and how it might fit into a family and look at all the different benefits and some examples of families that have, have had one. Um, and we also have uh, technology and sensory grants available uh, to children with visual impairment. So our grant team can give personalised specialist advice um, and you can apply online or you, or you can telephone uh, the team and have that one-to-one -one contact with them.
Uh, and they are looking at the child's age and what stage they're at as to what things might help support them. Uh, so it can be in the form of sensory toys or it could be some technology equipment. Uh, so it could be maybe a braille note, it could be some magnification equipment, it could be something like a PC or a laptop that might help. It might be things like uh, specialist keyboards. Um, so the whole wealth of things that they can look at to see what might support a child. Uh, with our technology grants, uh, Guide Dogs provides up to 90% of the cost for those. Um, so that's another service we do have. Um, over lockdown, um, we introduced our Tech for All service, which is a pilot scheme. And that is, um, it's free Apple iPads and iPhones uh, for children with a visual impairment. And that's the proof that needs to be given. Uh, so it's for children aged three to 18. So for primary age children, um, it's an iPad. And for secondary school children, they're able to choose from an iPad or an iPhone. Um, and Apple equipment's been chosen because it's got really good accessibility features that are already built in. So magnification speech and so on. Um, and we also provide as part of that package, um, um, sort of tutorials about safety and also how to set up that device. So we know that children then are accessing it safely and parents are obviously fully informed of how to keep their child safe online too. And we're working with BT to provide that equipment. Um, it's a time limited service and we've got limited numbers. So if there's anybody that has particular interest in that, they need to perhaps apply straight away because it's not going to be open too much longer. Um, you can apply online or via our guideline. Um, just in terms of the guideline, I should have said at the beginning that all our services can be accessed by our guideline telephone number, which is an 0800 number. It's advertised on the website and I'll also share that afterwards as well. Uh, so people have that for reference. And I'll just move on to our guide dog services. So our guide dog service might be much more familiar to people and one you've perhaps heard of already. Um, and that's for both uh, young people and adults. So young people are assessed in just the same way as an adult would be and we're ensuring they're able to control and support a dog just like an adult would be able to. Do. So our youngest guide dog owners are probably about the age of 14 and some of our elder ones are uh, maybe early 90s um, with a guide dog. Uh, certainly in the northwest we've got a gentleman who was 88 when he applied for his first guide dog and he was absolutely fit as a fiddle, really keen to get out and had the routes to do. So we will consider anybody who would like to have a guide dog and, and meets our requirements. Um, age isn't necessarily a barrier to that. So what they do is they walk a rough sort of straight line down the pavement, avoiding what we call solid obstacles. They stand at curb edges to let their owner know they're at the roadside. The guide dog owner is always responsible for giving those directions to the dog and for supporting a dog um, whilst they're out working together. So it really is a partnership. Um, what we're looking at is for somebody to walk roughly ab about 40 minutes each day or about a mile, um, having those routes to do and the want to do routes, um, working a dog for five days a week um, to maintain that training that they have. Um, and we say who can have a guide dog is somebody who's got a visual impairment and it's impacting their ability to travel and move around safely and confidently. Uh, and we'd like them to obviously give that dog a good quality of life um, and follow the training we're able to provide when training them together. Um, we also have companion dogs, which is perhaps a little bit similar to the buddy dog scheme, but for adults. So again, it's to give confidence, companionship, responsibility to an adult with sight loss. There's various pilots across the country um, at various stages. So again, that's something else people can express an interest in. It may be a working guide dog is not for them, but actually they'd like that companionship from a dog. And just finally, very quickly, I will mention our My Sighted Guide service, which is our adult non-dog service. And that's matching a person with a visual impairment with a volunteer who's able to guide them around doing what we call the nice things in life. So it could be doing activities such as maybe going for a leisure walk and going for a coffee. It could be perhaps going to a museum or a gardens. Um, Anything that's social that isn't sort of life dependent, such as shopping or medical appointments could be considered. And again, that's applying through the guideline um, 
to access that service or online and, and we have lots of information too just in case anybody would like any information about hints and tips of how to guide somebody with a visual impairment we've got information on the website and we also run what we call friends and family courses too that have been online um and we do them in person in in normal times um and, and that again is, is looking at how to support somebody with a visual impairment getting out and about and in the right way and not manhandling anybody and I think that is a whistle stop tour of everything and I will pass you to Mary and she'll tell you a little bit about her experiences hello do I start you yes. can start now Mary we can all hear you thank you <laughs> thank you um, hello everyone I'm sure I can't see any of you actually but I'm sure there's people there that I do know Chelsea's gone off to her bed Chelsea come here come here um Chelsea is uh, she's seven and a half she's my third guide dog um and I've had her five and a half years and <laughs> I've been very very lucky I was um uh, registered blind and then I got a dog a year later. So in, I was, in 2006, I got a dog. I was registered blind in, in 1990, but um, I was able to keep work, working till 2005. And I got my first dog in 2006. So, um, and I've never looked back really. The, she's given me the confidence to go on and, and do other things. Uh, all my dogs have been female, actually, uh, Black Labrador, uh, German Shepherd, and now a, a Golden Retriever. And um, I, I used to ride when I, was, when I was young. For years and years, I had my own horse, uh, but I was what they called a happy hacker. Uh, but I wanted to try and get back to do it, uh, to ride if I could. And when I got my first guide dog, I contacted... Uh, the RDA and they um, told me that Withenshaw was my nearest uh, RDA so I went there I started there um, uh, but I wasn't there very long I moved on to Mid Cheshire uh, RDA and I stayed with them for, for years uh, and until you know this they had to close because the place where they were uh, the lady was retiring and selling up and they're now setting up in a new place. But um, I, I ride now with able-bodied people, but I'm still very attached to, to Mid Cheshire and the RDA because the guide dogs and um, riding uh, and riding for the disabled, they changed my life. They really did. They, they just, they give me pleasure every day. <laughs> And I'm very lucky. I'm able to um, ride twice a week. I, I do dressage, uh, which I started to learn from, from going to Mid Cheshire. Um, and they really encouraged me. And, um, they, you know, they taught me really everything I know. And um, I used to go for holidays to Cluid. Um, I've been there, that was wonderful. And they also encouraged me to, to, to go on. I went to Talland. I go, I go there. I've been there a lot, having lessons with, with the Huttons, Pammy, Pippa and Charlie. Charlie used to call me Mary Dujardin, <laughs> just for a joke. And he said I was the easiest person he's ever had to teach because whatever he told me to do, I did it <laughs> um, and he said I never argued I never <laughs> you know tried did anything different I did what he told me to do and I love going there and they're wonderful uh, with me and um, uh, I've always taken my dogs there as well uh, the first dog Karin she was wonderful she she went there and she used to run loose with the rest of the yard dogs while I was riding and one day I was having a lesson and, and Pammy Hutton shouted, get that dog a horse. And Karin had gone up on the mountain block <laughs> and she was looking for me, uh, you know, over the arena. She didn't come into the arena, but she was just checking where I was. She would always keep coming back and finding out where's mum. And <laughs> it was so funny. Everybody laughed. 
because Cara in the Black Labrador was stood there <laughs> ready to mount a horse. So that, that was really good. But the, the guide dogs gave me the confidence to, to take buses and go to go to to ride and you know they'd stay in the classroom or um in one of the offices while I rode and then they'd guide me back either to the bus or to the railway station and back on the trains and I used to do that regularly um and now where I go uh, I go to a, a place uh, called Cheshire Riding School and there's no public transport I can't get there uh, with the aid of the dog. So I am reliant on my husband to take me there um, and uh, walk the dog uh, on the land while I ride. But, um, you know, it's, it can't be helped. That that's just the way it is. But they've given me such confidence. And um, I did last, not last week, two weeks ago, I did um, a freestyle dressage to music, the uh, first one I've ever done. And when they asked me if I'd do it, I said, yes, I'll do it, yeah. Thinking they'd give me a test and give me the music and I'd just learn it and, and do it. But oh no, she said, uh, you find your music um, and, and let me send it to me. And I'm not into music, but my husband found a, a, a suitable piece for walk, trot, canter. And it's really good, actually. And um, and then <laughs> she said to me, now do your floor plan. <laughs> I had to get that done. Anyway, I did it. And it was my first one, and I had no time to warm up. I had two minutes on the horse to warm him up. Um, and I did it. And I came sixth out of 13. And it was really good, <laughs> but um, I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm doing another one at the end of the month. So um, uh, I'm going Mary, to- Mary, can I just uh, jump in and say, uh, yeah. very many congratulations on that. It's your first competitive effort. I think that's absolutely uh, amazing. <laughs> and I, I can see somebody's, um, uh, somebody's just asking here, did, did you, so somebody says, wow, did you video it? I think everyone's hoping no. that they, can, um, they can see that. Yeah, no, on. I didn't, I didn't. And, well, no. while, I've, while I've got you, I, uh, this is probably a very unfair question because um, obviously uh, everybody is an individual, but I think so for, for some of the people watching and, and certainly afterwards when we put this on YouTube, I just wonder if you've got, even if just one sort of top tip for RDA groups who perhaps are welcoming a vision impaired person into their group for the first time. Um, have you have anything given your experience of, of riding in general oh. or the couple of RDA groups, whether there's anything you would give out there as a pearl of wisdom? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, don't underestimate them. Um, the, you know, if they say I can ride and things like that. I've only been refused a ride once, and that was this year in Wales. I went to a riding place because um, uh, I wanted to do a beach ride. I've ridden beaches in Australia, New Zealand, France, everywhere, England, Ireland. Uh, but she was horrified when I, when I went, when she saw a guide dog. It didn't matter what I said, there was no way she was going to take me out. She was really horrified, this girl. I could see it in her face. And she said to me, oh, I said, you know, I'm a competent rider. I'll, you can assess me if you like. I'll come and uh, have a lesson in the arena first uh, before I go. And she said, I'll have to check with, with the insurance, but I'll get back to you. I will. I will. She, she didn't even phone me. She texted me and said, sorry, the insurance said no. Now, everywhere else, I've never had a problem. Um, so, uh, and, and I rode in Wales. I rode on the beach, you know, through the surf and everything this time. The, the, there's a way of doing it. There's, um, I think the RDA, Mid Cheshire were very good at finding, finding ways round things, like doing a competition, uh, somebody stands on X and they call the Now that works for me. I don't want the test calling. So everybody's an individual and just find out what their capabilities are. My only disability is my eyes, but there's a lot of people that I know that, that ride. 
they may have a sight problem, but they'll, they'll have multiple problems. Um, so, it, but they're very good. The RDAs that I've been, you know, I've been involved with a talent. I always go and say hello to them. They've got an RDA as well. Um, and they're very good at getting to know the person and seeing what they can do and encouraging them to do more without frightening them or anything but I like to be challenged I do you know I I, do, I don't mind if a horse spooks or it books or anything like that I'm I'm okay with that not everybody would be but you know the people have got to know me over the years and they it's like the RDA say it's what you can do not what you can't do so but um I love it and that keeps me going. I'm 73 in January and I, I do Pilates twice a week and I do yoga as well. And I ride twice a week. And wherever we go in the world, my husband always makes sure I get a ride. Whether And I've ridden in Russia. Uh, where else have I ridden? The only place I couldn't get a ride was China. They said, we eat horses. We don't <laughs> We eat them the same with dogs <laughs> they never they never heard of a guide dog no <laughs> we don't have guide dogs no we, we eat dogs <laughs> so um you know but it's it's great australia everywhere and i don't mind you know if people want to assess me i i'm very happy to do that and i think that's very responsible but no with a visual impairment it's just getting everybody is different we are we are all i'm confident but i've been doing it for years and years now um and uh, you know the horse is the horse has to be safe i suppose it has to be safe but uh i still need plenty of impulsion <laughs> i like, I like a, a horse in front of the leg <laughs> yeah thank you mary that, that that's been absolutely brilliant um um, so if I can just come back to you, just thinking sort of about our two organisations and some of the things that sort of um, uh, bring us together is obviously the, the, the animals um, that, that yeah. we're working with. Um, and um, I'm really just thinking, I was, I was thinking about what you said about my time to play and some of the ways that um, you're using dogs in that environment outside of the sort of traditional way that people perhaps think about guide dogs. And as an organisation, RDA as well is kind of looking at where where are the ways that um, horses can bring benefits to people outside of perhaps sort of traditional riding and driving lessons and things like that? Um, and, and do you have a view on that sort of the, the place that animals have in, um, in, in, our, in our broader lives? I think just to confirm, our My Time to Play yeah. session doesn't involve dogs. However, oh, um, it, should. it doesn't, unfortunately. <laughs> um, however, just from our buddy dogs, it just shows when we place a dog with a child in that situation, just the confidence it can give a child. And, you know, we've had reports of um, and some of our fosterers who actually look after our training dogs even in weekend have said similar. Their children have come home and maybe read to one of the dogs they're fostering. Uh, if they're a bit underconfident at reading. We might have had uh, families with buddy dogs that have um, said that language has come on because maybe that child has started to talk to the dog and it's just brought that confidence of something they can do and really engage with. Uh, and I think with all animals, I think it is like that. I think I think they just get under our skin, don't they? Um, and I think it does make a real big difference to both our children and young people and our adults um, to just, I know, I know, another guide dog owner that sometimes comes out with me she said it just gives her a sense of freedom um and and it just allows her to do things independently and feel that independence and not having to rely on somebody um she can do it with a dog and she gets confidence and companionship from a dog and i think our children and young people for, with our different services there again feel that companionship from the dogs and, and take that confidence from them yeah. yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I can see um, Mary very much nodding in agreement there. Um, yes. 
Um, I we've we've we're very strict on our um, half an hour webinars. And yes. I'd just like to congratulate the both of you on uh, on coming in so spectacularly on time. Um, it is exactly half past, and so um, I'm I'm sad to say um, because I think we could we could talk about this and certainly your experiences, um, Mary, for a lot longer. But um, we will leave it there. Um, Zoe, thank you. If you wouldn't mind, um, if you've got anything you want to share um, with me or pop in the chat now in the way of links, um, we'll obviously make that uh, available afterwards anyway. Um, but uh, for now, I'd just like to say a huge, huge thank you uh, on behalf of everyone watching this evening and everyone who will enjoy this um, in future on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and, and sharing um, that important information um, and also your story, Mary, of how both RDA and Chelsea and your other dogs um, have, um, have brought so much confidence to you. So thanks yeah. everybody for joining. Um, uh, some of you I will hopefully see next Thursday. Um, Zoe and Mary, good evening and thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank bye you. Bye.